Welcome everyone. In this video, I'm going to explain exposure, or what people have started to refer to as the exposure triangle. If you've ever looked down at your camera and seen a bunch of numbers that you didn't really understand, then this video is for you. But if you generally understand what those numbers are, but they don't, you don't really understand how they affect your picture, then this video is also for you. And if you're new to this channel, please like and subscribe. And if you've been here before, but notice I'm talking a little slower than normal today, it's because I want people to fully grasp the information. And if I talk too quickly, um, it might go a little too fast. That's the reason why. I'm also going to put a lot of my images that I've taken over the years in this video as well. I learned about exposure during my first photography class in high school and my teacher, Greg Wall Stevens, who had a huge impact on my life, taught exposure in fairly simple terms, and I'm going to share that with you today. There are three main things that we can adjust on our cameras to change the look of our images or the exposure. Those three things are the aperture or f-stop, the shutter speed, and the ISO. Your goal is to have all three of these things in balance to get a proper exposure. Instead of using the word balance, let's use the word equal. And that's where the symbolism of the equilateral exposure triangle comes in. But don't worry about that so much right now. It will make more sense a little later. First, I'm going to talk about what each of these three inputs is and how it affects your picture. Then I'm going to talk about how you keep all three of them in balance, and then you'll understand at the end of the video how to properly expose your pictures and how to make the right choices in order to get the images that you're looking for. You'll see these numbers when shooting automatic modes, but you can start to change them and make smart decisions in the aperture priority mode, shutter priority, and manual, or the M setting. You might be able to set the ISO in any mode, but we'll talk more about ISO a little later. One thing to also keep in mind is that fully mechanical film cameras had a standard set of numbers for each of the settings. And as technology changed, you were able to make finer adjustments to these settings. But all of the settings on modern cameras are still based on these old standard settings and numbers in between. These standard numbers are often referred to as full or whole or stops, but this will make a little more sense as we go. And also, just if you're starting to feel like, wow, this is a lot, I know it can feel that way at first. But once you start using exposure or once you start changing the settings on your camera and making smart choices about exposure, it will become a lot easier. And maybe after doing it for a few months, it'll just become second nature and you'll be able to get that technical stuff out of the way. So you'll be able to focus on making better pictures or making those creative choices that you want to make. This is really a building block to your success. So the first set of settings that we're going to talk about are f-stops. F-stops are often referred to as the aperture, and this is the diameter of the opening at the back of your lens that lets light pass through. These numbers don't appear to increase logically, and that's because they represent the denominator in a fraction that describes the size of the opening. When you physically turned a ring on an old lens, it would change the aperture, and it would also physically click or stop when you hit these numbers. So that's where we get the term F-stop, or F numbers. A smaller F number is a big opening that lets in more light, and a larger F number is a small opening that lets in less light. Full F stops in order effectively from brightest to darkest, where each number left to right has the volume of light passing through are 1.4, 2, 2.8, 4, 5.6, 8, 11, 16, and 22. Your camera will likely let you set or adjust these numbers in one third or one half stop increments. And some lenses can have F stops that are smaller or larger. And these numbers are just going to be specific to your individual lens. Because of physics, the size of the opening changes how much of your image is in focus from the front to the back. This is what's known as depth of field, depth of field, sorry. A large opening or a small F number will result in very little in focus other than what you're focused on. This is a very popular choice for outdoor portrait photography. So for instance, if you shoot a portrait at F2 with the lens focused on the person's face, hopefully it's in focus, 
Everything else will be blurry. Those blurry blobs in the background are referred to as bokeh or bokeh, depending on your pronunciation. A large F number will result in more stuff in focus that's a little whole, and that's something you probably would use for a landscape or a product shot in the studio. Most lenses are sharpest between 5.6 and F8, so you might want to use those uh, numbers or those settings on a studio portrait. Just know that the lower the F number, the less stuff will be in focus, and the higher the F number, the more stuff will be in focus front to back, the depth of field. The shutter speed is the fraction of a second or seconds if you're taking a long exposure that your sensor is capturing the image. Traditionally, a shutter was a curtain that kept light from striking the film, and it only opened when you were taking a picture. The length of time that your settings told the curtain to open was known as the shutter speed. Some modern cameras may have a physical shutter and some don't. Regardless, we still use the term. And these numbers are very logical. On those old mechanical film cameras, there were shutter speeds on top usually, traditionally on a dial. And when you turned it to each full shutter speed that I'm about to talk about, it would click or stop. Full shutter speeds, for example, are 1 2,000th, 1 1,000th, 1 500th, 1 250th, 1 1 25th, 1 60th, then 1 30th, then 1 15th, then 1 8th, then 1 4th, so on and so forth. Now, modern cameras are able to give you shutter speeds that are uh, maybe as fast as 1 8,000th of a second, and maybe they go as long as 1 30, uh, I mean 30 seconds. You also can probably change them in one third or one half stop increments. And this is something that you'll be able to change possibly in those custom settings, but just know that that's there. If you want to stop a model that's posing in the studio, you're going to need a shutter speed of about a one two fiftieth or one two hundredth of a second. If you want to freeze a dancer jumping through the air, you're going to need a shutter speed closer to a one four thousandth of a second. And another rule of thumb is that if you want to avoid your image being blurry from your hands shaking, you'll want to use a shutter speed that's not any slower than one over the millimeter of your lens. Some people even say that with a larger or high megapixel camera, this should be one over two times, two times the millimeter of uh, your lens. But for the most part, this is where something called IBIS or in-body image stabilization that's in the current professional cameras comes in. And that helps to counteract that handshake, but really it can only work so good and it can only do so much. So just know that, that still that one over the millimeter of the lens is probably still a good uh, benchmark and something to think about. Before we move on, I just wanted to say that on my website, you can purchase two different lighting handbooks. The first one covers multiple light setups, and the second one covers working with only one light. In these digital downloads, I'll walk you through the process of setting up 20 and 23 different lighting setups, respectively. As a bonus, all of my lighting handbooks come with my intro to lighting guide for free. This 31 page PDF covers all of the technical aspects of photography, including exposure. So it's the perfect complement to this video. To purchase your copy today, just go to johngress.com slash lighting handbooks. The ISO is a number that tells us how sensitive your sensor is at that moment to light. The lower the ISO typically, the higher the image quality. Most cameras begin at 100 ISO and double in sensitivity every time that we double the number. So these numbers look like this, 100 ISO, 200, 400, 800, 1600, etc. When I started off shooting film, these were the film speeds that you could buy in the store. And then when digital cameras came along, they eventually let you change the ISO in one third and one half stop increments too, just like the shutter speeds and aperture that we've talked about. Lower numbers or lower ISO numbers will result in lower noise, and noise essentially are those flecks of white or color that you see when you zoom way into the image. 
So typically you wanna keep these numbers as low as possible uh, in order to get the best results, in order to get a more noise-free, sharp image. But there are situations like photographing sports in the middle of a cloudy day where you're gonna need to go higher. There are times in the studio where you're gonna need to go higher because maybe you're using window light or something and maybe you're trying to photograph your kid's basketball game in a gym, you're definitely gonna have to go really high. So, you know, there's the ideal and then there's reality. So in order to record an image at any given ISO, you'll need the same volume of light to hit the sensor, regardless of the brightness or the darkness of the scene to correctly expose um, the image. Technically, exposure is a precise number. You could use a light meter and that would tell you how bright it is at that given moment, tell you how to set up your camera. But really, in effect, you just need to get close to the right exposure in order to look good so that the image looks pretty good on the back of your camera. Really, that's what we're all going for anyway. So, or how it looks on your screen. So you just want it to look good on the screen. And in general, exposure is like kicking a goal in soccer or football, if you will. You just need to get it in the net. But also keep in mind that when compared to the size of the field or the pitch, the net is only so large. So it is a target. You can hit it. You don't need to precisely hit it. Just get the ball in there. Think of it another way. What if we needed to fill a bucket with water? The sensor would be our bucket and the size of the bucket would be determined by the ISO. A low ISO number would actually mean a big bucket and a high ISO number would make our sensor very sensitive and we'd have a very small bucket. The f-stop would be equal to the diameter of the hose that we're using to fill the bucket. So if we have a big, a big f number like 2.8, that's a big hose. If we have a small f-stop like 16, that's a very narrow hose. And then the amount of time that we need to turn the faucet on in order to get the water to go through the hose and fill the bucket and then turn it off, that would be the shutter speed. So the ISO is how large our bucket is, the aperture is how big our hose is, and the shutter speed is how long we're gonna leave the faucet on. And in any event, what we're trying to do is we're trying to fill the bucket to the top. So every time you gotta fill the bucket, relatively speaking, to the top. In the real world, if you wanna take a photo outside on a sunny day, your exposure will likely be 1 100th one of a second at F16 at ISO 100 which is an example of the sunny 16 rule, which states that in full sun, the exposure will be one over the ISO at F16. And just so we're dealing in whole numbers, let's say that that exposure is actually, actually one one twenty fifth of a second at F16 at ISO 100. Now at one one twenty fifth of a second, that's probably too slow to stop a posing model or the motion of a posing model for the most part. So we'll want to use a higher shutter speed. And this is where Mr. Stevens comes back in, my high school photography teacher. He had a slider in his class with all of the shutter speeds on the top, the part that moved. And then he had all of the f-stops on the fixed side on the bottom. So if you lined up 1 1 25th of a second at f16 uh, was lined up over here. That's our exposure outside in the sun. Uh, you would have all the shutter speed and aperture combinations that would be correct at ISO 100 in the sun. It would be very beautiful. They'd be right there before your eyes. Now, 1 250th of a second would probably be better for that model that's posing in the studio or just posing for you anywhere. It doesn't really matter. So if we look at our chart, we go from 1 1 25th at F16 and we come over here to 1 250th. Well, now you can see below 1 250th that it says F11. And so that's the aperture that we're going to use at 1 250th of a second. And that's how it's going to work. Now, if we needed to shoot at 1 4,000th of a second in order to freeze movement, or maybe we, we'd have to shoot at 2.8. Or maybe we want to shoot at 2.8, so then we got to set our shutter speed to, to 1 4,000th of a second. Because we might, we might want to use 2.8 in order to get a blurry background. And that's how that relationship is going to work. Let's say we need to shoot at 1 8,000th of a second at 2.8.
Maybe we want to freeze motion outdoors or we want to shoot at 2.8 and somehow that means that 1 8,000th of a second is the shutter speed that we have to use. Uh, we want to get a blurry background, for instance, uh, when shooting a model's headshot. The only way we can do that in this situation is to increase our ISO to 200 which will slide our shutter speeds over one stop to your right. Whenever you have a correct exposure, your triangle, exposure triangle, is in balance. And when you change one of the sides, you have to change one of the other sides to remain in balance. So if we have our shutter speed at 1 8,000th of a second, and we've got our aperture over here at f2, our ISO needs to be at 100. If our aperture has to go to 2.8, then our ISO needs to go to 200. Well, I hope I did as good of a job explaining this as Mr. Stevens did. If you guys have any questions or comments, just leave them below. I want to help you get through this, so don't be afraid to ask. As always, stay safe, have a great day, and I'll talk to you soon.